Glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. All right. He is so worthy. No one is more worthy. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Yeah, this is amazing grace. Awesome. You may be seated. Good job, Chris and friends here. We're glad you're here. Man, do you see the setup they have up here? They got so many pedals. It's like, that's a, there's like a wah-wah pedal, right? Is that what you call one of them? That's a volume pedal. Volume pedal. They probably got a jazz pedal and rhythm pedal. I think one of these launches is a shuttle. I'm not really sure. They got a whole lot of pedals going on up here. 
Man, no joke. Well, good deal. Well, we're really glad you're here. Man, the Lord is worthy. Amen. I'm glad you chose to come and worship him this morning. You could be sleeping in bed right now, but you chose to get up and come worship Jesus. There was a man who was in bed on Sunday morning sleeping, and it's like 9.15, and his wife comes in and says, Honey, we're going to be late for church. you got to get up because I don't want to go to church. She said, Come on, honey. We need to go. We need to go worship the Lord. And he's like, I don't want to go. She's like, You have to go. He said, give me, give me two good reasons I should go to church. She said, because it's Sunday and we're supposed to worship the Lord. And number two, you're the pastor. <laughs> anyway, well, I got up this morning. I made it, okay? I barely made it, but I got here. So, hey, I want to welcome those of you who are watching Revolution Church online. We're very glad you're there. Please let us know you're there. Interact with us some way, somehow. You know, send an emoji. Say what town you're watching from or send your name. And um, also... You can uh, like this and share it with your friends. Let them know that you're watching. Leave some comments. Leave all kinds of comments. If you don't like something I say, go for it. I don't care. I'm a big guy. I can take it. And at the end of the message, we have a question and answer session. I love that. I love the question and answer. Somebody stumped me last week. Uh, Larry did. Larry sent me a question. I'm like, I don't know. So I studied on it this week. Well, to be honest, I studied it on 3.30 this morning. But anyway, I, I, figured, I woke up in the middle of the night and I realized, oh, I didn't study for Larry's question. So I got up and I studied for it. So I got a great answer for you, Larry. Larry's in the house. I saw his orange hat. Where are you at? Okay, cool. All right, cool. Well, we're, we're glad that Larry's here. He'll get an answer to his question. And so if you have a question about anything, something you saw in the news this week, something you read in your Bible reading this week, uh, something about my message this morning, anything, just send us a question and we'd be glad to answer that for you. Um, so text those to me right there. And um, let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. And uh, this is an important time. This kind of sets the tone for what happens this morning because we want to make sure our hearts and our minds and our wills are open to the Lord right now so that He truly can speak to us. We don't, the last thing we want to do this morning is just go through motions, right? So let's, I'm going to give you a moment of silence just to talk to the Lord on your own, and then I'll lead us. Father, we come to you uh, with thankful hearts. Lord, we live in a country where we not only can go to church, we can go with a clear conscience, knowing that, um, that we're not going to be persecuted, we're not going to be arrested for what we're doing here this morning. And yet we have brothers and sisters in Christ all around the planet who are risking their very lives to be in the house of the Lord. They're meeting in underground churches in places where there's persecution, there's Muslims who have become Christ followers, and their family doesn't know it yet because they're afraid if they find out, they'll take their life. Lord, this is real. This is the, the kind of things that we take for granted as spoiled Americans. Lord, help us not take that for granted. Lord, help us realize what's happening here this morning, even in the middle of a pandemic, is, is the body of Christ. We are assembling together. We're not forsaking it. We are here to encourage one another, to provoke one another, to love and good works, and most of all, to lift up our Savior's name, Jesus Christ. So I pray, Lord, that everything that happens this morning would glorify him, that it would not point to us or someone with talent, but would point to the one who is worthy. And we pray that all worship would be pleasing to him, and it would be in spirit and in truth. And we pray this in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord. So as we continue to worship, I just want to encourage you to... Um... You know, think about this, the words that we're saying and the words that we're singing. Um, and this particular song ties directly to the message today. So as we sing this out, it's more than just words. It's coming from our hearts, and we're learning from what we're saying, and we're exalting him through what we say. He is the lion and the lamb. He's the great conqueror. He can take care of anything. Amen? All right, let's sing together. Our God is 
lion, lion of Judah, is roaring in power, fighting our battle, every knee will bow before him. stop him no matter how great the problem let's sing that out who can stop the lord almighty who can stop the lord almighty who can stop the lord almighty who can stop the lord y'all sing that out together who can stop over your troubles sing it over your pain we've got the glory Shout of praise in this place. And I heard a thousand stories of one day. Think your life, but I heard tender whisper of love. Dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I was never alone. Trying to get on that track.
Let's give him a shout of praise. Amen. Yes, Lord, you are perfect. Got to get all of our technology straight. He is great. Let's sing that to him. Let's sing this song directly to him this morning.
It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. You give life. Give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you. your praise. pray with me. Lord, you are so great. Even in the midst of trouble and in the rubble, Lord, you're still so visible to us. We know that we can rely on you no matter what the pain, what the hurt, what the hang up. So today, God, we come before you and we lay all of our baggage at your feet because we know you can control it and you can get us through it. Lord, prepare our hearts and our minds to hear the message that you have for us today so that we could leave changed and we could help change other people too, God. 
It's in your holy name we pray. When we sing and we do the praise and worship time, um, what we're doing is we're telling God how great He is and how much we love Him. When we come to the Word of God, it's time for Him to tell us how great He is and how much He loves us. So the worship continues. That's not the worship part. The whole service is the worship part. So let's prepare ourselves for the, the receiving of the Word of God. Um, I have two special readers coming up this morning. Isaiah and Caitlin, come on up here. And the reason I chose, Caitlin asked me months ago, she said, since you're doing Deuteronomy, can I read, when we get to the part where we get to my favorite verse, come on over here to this black mic for me. When, uh, when, when we get, she asked, said, when we get to the part where we get to my favorite verse, can I read that? I'm like, sure, you can read that. So, uh, but because it's 26 verses long in this chapter, I didn't want her to do it all by herself. So Isaiah is going to do most of it. And then when we get to verse 25, she memorized this at camp last year. And so she wants to be able to say that to you. She's still going to use the scream because she's a little bit nervous. You can tell Isaiah is excited. <laughs> All right. Isaiah, step up to the mic there and speak right into it for me. There you go. When the Lord your God Keep going. brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Persiites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, you must devote to completely destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. For they will turn away your sons from your following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and he would quickly destroy you. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall break down their altars and dash in pieces the pillars and the chop down their ashram and burn their carved images with fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are in the face of the earth. It was not because you are in, in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. It is because the Lord loves you and he is keeping your oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Now, therefore, that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations, and repays to their face those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with one who hates him, he will repay him to his face. You shall therefore be careful to do the commandment and the statutes and the rules that I command you today. And because you listen to these rules and keep and keep and do them. The Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the steadfast love that he swore to your fathers. He will love you, bless you, and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your room and the fruit of your ground, your grain and your wine and your oil, the increase of your herds and the young of your livestock, and the land that he swore to your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all peoples. There shall not be a male or female barren among you, or among your livestock. And the Lord your and the Lord will take away from you all the sickness and none of the evil diseases of Egypt, which you knew will he inflict on you, but he will lay them on who hate you. And you shall consume all your peoples that the Lord your God will give over to you. You your eyes shall not be will not pity them, 
neither shall you serve their gods, for that would be a snare to you. If you say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and all Egypt. And the greater Charles that your eyes saw in the signs of wonders that your arm, outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought, brought you out, so will the Lord your God do to all the peoples of whom you are afraid. Moreover, the Lord your God will send hornets among them until those who are left and hide themselves from, from you are destroyed. You shall not be in dread of them, for the Lord your God is in your midst, a great and awesome God. The Lord your God will clear away these nations before you little by little. You may not make the end of them at once, lest the wild beasts, beasts grow too numerous for you. But the Lord your God will give them over to you and throw them into the great confusion until they are destroyed. And he will give their kings into your hand, and, and you shall make their name perish from under heaven. No one shall be able to stand against you until you have destroyed them. The carved images of their gods you shall burn with fire. You shall not covet the silver or gold that is on them, or take it for yourself, lest you be ensnared by it, for it is an abomination to the Lord your God. And you shall not bring in abomin abominable th things into your house or become devoted to destruction like it. You shall unlikely detest or abhor it. You shall it for it you devote devoted for destruction. All right, good job, kids. All right. All right. So you, you know what an oxymoron is? It's, uh, it's something that appears to be true, or it appears to not make sense, but it actually does. And there's a lot of phrases we use in the English language are like this, like jumbo shrimp. Kind of, it seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? Um, you've probably heard some of these. Uh, working vacation. That's kind of an oxymoron, right? And then... Uh, how about found missing? <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. This is my favorite one here. Uh, same difference. I hate when people say that. It's just that you're not making any sense at all. How about this one? You've, Microsoft works. Um, no, no, it doesn't. <laughs> um, but biblically speaking, here's one that doesn't seem to make any sense. And a lot of atheists have a big problem with this is the phrase holy war. Now, the word holy war is not in the Bible, but it's been used by people who will use the Bible to prove their cause. And there's been a lot of times in history where Christians have abused this. And, you know, one of the examples is the Crusades. Now, you need to go back and read real history on the Crusades. There was a time when Catholics did return to the Middle East for a just cause because Muslims took it over in a very bloody way, and they drove the Muslims back out. And, and at first they were justified. But on the second and third crusade, more so than the first, they just got way out of control, where they were just going anywhere and finding anybody who wasn't Catholic and just killing them. And if they even looked like a Muslim, they were going to kill them. And so it was abused, and they called it a holy war. And we see, in, even in history, the Spanish Inquisition. You know, in the name of God, we're, you know, we're drowning people, we're burning people at the stake, we're doing all kinds of crazy things in the name of holy war. But that's not something just for ancient times. It happens all the time in history. Today we've got jihad, which is holy war, you know, to where they are ISIS and others and other fractions of radical Islam are trying to take over the world. And anyone who does not bow the knee to Allah and Muhammad is prophet, they, they will die if they do not. And that they feel totally justified in this holy war. A lot of people who don't know history very well will say that uh, Hitler was a Christian. He absolutely was not. He persecuted Christians, practicing Jews, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists. He, he persecuted everybody. Uh, he, and he, he was per introducing what was called neo-paganism. He went back to the Druid roots of Germanic tribes that believed that they were the superior race and that their gods looked down upon them as a superior Aryan race. And so he was doing, basically in his mind, what was a holy war. Did you know the Hindus practicing holy war in India right now? There's radical Hindus. You think Hindus, peaceful people, you know? You, no, no. They're bloody. There's a certain faction of radical Hindus who are willing to kill for Hinduism. 
You would think Buddhism would be peaceful, but no, there's parts of Buddhism. There's right on the cover of Time magazine, the face of Buddhist terrorism. And that's a big deal in China. You know, there are radicalized Buddhists in there. They're not just sitting around with their legs crossed in a funny way, or like them and Hindus. So this is a difficult passage for many people. And many skeptics of Christianity will point to this chapter and say, see, God promotes genocide. And that's absolutely not what is happening here at all. And other people will overreact like the Quakers and other Christian groups and become pacifists and say, you know, we don't believe in war of any kind. They even oppose the, even the Revolutionary War, any type of war. And my question for them is, you know, what would you do about Hitler? You know, you wouldn't have stopped him. You would just let him take over Hit, uh, Europe and the world. Um, and then you'll hear people, and they put this on bumper stickers, say, war is not the answer. Okay, so what do you do to stop people? What do you do to stop the Saddam Husseins of the world and people who are killing their own people? Or any, what, did you, what do you do about Stalin, who killed 16 million of his own people? His own people. You just sit back and do nothing? You know, I, I don't think, war sometimes is the answer. And, if you, and, that, and it's actually biblical. Is there such thing as a just war? There absolutely is. And that's what Deuteronomy chapter 7 is about. It's about a just war. It is about God using Israel to punish a very evil people, as we'll talk about, and to take what was rightly given to them. You may not realize this, but the Bible talks about over and over again that God is a warrior. It uses different phrases, different ways. But like, for example, in Exodus chapter 15, the Lord is a man of war. So if you have a problem biblically with war, you got a problem with God. Okay. Um, in fact, 26 times in the Bible, it refers to God as a God of war, or the most common phrase is the Lord of hosts. And that's how I talk about people who welcome you into their home. Host means armies. In fact, you hear that song on the radio sometimes, the God of angel armies. He is the God who is the head of the, the most powerful army in the universe. And, and he will, will uh, he'll use that army as needed to destroy as necessary. In fact, he's going to conquer the world with his army. So God is a God of war. It, sh it shouldn't be something that we should have a problem with. So there's four points to my message this morning. Number one, there's the purging of the land. Number two, there's the passion of the Lord. Number three, there's the promise of the Lord, and then there's the protection of the Lord. So let's go, let's jump right in, get your seatbelts on, and we're going to go through this chapter. We're not going to cover every single phrase, but we are going to kind of see what the overall message of it is. First of all, the purging of the land. So you've got these groups of people with funny names, Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, termites, parasites, all those different ones, you know. They're all in the list right here. And what's interesting, have you heard of any of these before outside the Bible? No, because they were wiped out, okay, for the most part. Now, they weren't wiped out completely here because if you read later in the Minor Prophets, you will still see the Canaanites being mentioned. So Israel did not do the complete job. Um, but it's, they were surrounded by seven nations much mightier than them. And they're coming in as the underdogs, and they're going to just show the world, literally the unknown world, that God is the one who's powerful. Because these bunch of nomads who just, you know, basically, in re relatively speaking in history, were just slaves. And now they're just wandering through the wilderness. And the only weapons they have are the ones they took from Pharaoh. And they took from armies they conquered along the way. And so they're really a ragtag military battle. And people look at it and scratch their head and say, how did they beat Jericho? Must be God. And can I tell you, that's what should be happening in your life. How did you do this? Must be God. How did you marry her? <laughs> Must be God. You know, you, that's, God should be getting the credit for everything that's happened in our life. But you know, I, I love history because the Bible is history. It is his story, and it's still relevant today. You look at Israel today. Find the little tiny red dot in the middle. B barely bigger than the state of New Jersey. And yet it is surrounded, literally surrounded by Muslim nations that hate them. That, they're, that the, the, uh, all these nations, Iraq, Iran, their goal in writing is to push Israel into the Mediterranean Sea. They do not want them there. That's why when you talk about peace in the Middle East, most of the time it's like, okay, we'll sign the dotted line, give us $50 million, and then we're going to blow up Jerusalem again next week. They always just lie, lie, lie. There's always these peace trees. Every president wants to try to do peace in the Middle East. But when you've got people who are committed to destroy a nation and don't think they have the right to exist, that's what happened. That's why... Biblically speaking, we are pro-Israel because God is pro-Israel. They are still God's chosen people. 
There's not two plans of salvation. Some people teach that. Like, if you're a Jew, you're automatically saved. No, 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 no. Everybody must trust Jesus Christ. But keep in mind, Jesus was a Jew. He came from the Jews. The Word of God came from the Jews. And he is a Jewish Messiah. But he has expanded the gospel to the Gentiles, praise God. Otherwise, we would not be here this morning. But they have been surrounded this whole time, and nothing's new. Right back from Deuteronomy chapter 7 to here today, they're surrounded by countries that hate them. And yet, here's what's fascinating. Israel's population is 0.11 of the whole world's population. It is not much bigger than, than the greater Houston area. Okay? So think about that. And yet, they are number 20 in the world in their economy. Think about how many things are invented by Israel. It's amazing. Their economy is amazing, and it's all because God is blessing them. Their economy is bigger than almost all those other green countries put together because God is still blessing them today. He says, and when the Lord your God gives them over to you, and he says you should defeat them, complete destruction, make no treaties. If they say, hey, we surrender, say, no, no, you're dying. We're wiping you out. And people look at that and are like, man, how could God do that? Well, again, we'll get to that in a second. And he says to them, show no mercy. This, and again, it's not based on you're a certain race, you're gone, okay? There, there's a lot of things going on in this situation. So God, does God promote genocide? Let, let me show you that he does not. Number one, God waited patiently. The Canaanites were wicked, horrible people. You think about the wickedness that's happening in our world today. 26 million people are still slaves today, most of them sex trafficking, Okay? Think about the evil men who sell seven, eight-year-old girls and, and then think about a whole population like the Canaanites not only doing child prostitution, not only practicing gang rape as if it was a, a, a sacred thing to do in the temple, not, not only that, they are taking their children and they are burning them alive to Moloch, okay? They are... They are doing the most horrible things you can even imagine. I can't even say up front here. Archaeologists have discovered like Canaanite uh, statues and things like that, and they can't even talk about. There's one guy I was ta- listening to recently, and he was getting his PhD in Canaanite paganism, and he said he had to stop and take a break from it because it was so wicked and so vile, the things that they did to children, that they did to women, and just the brutality of these people. And if you knew that there was a nation like that here on the planet today and we dropped the A-bomb on them, you'd be like, yeah, I could see that happening. Okay? And so it's not a matter of genocide. It was a matter of God using Israel to punish these people. Now, here's what's really ironic. Is that when Israel, God's people, strayed away, guess what he did? He used wicked people to punish them. And God can do that way. And in your own personal lives, on your job, God can use you to make a lost person feel convicted about their sin and their need for Jesus. And at the same time, if you stray from God, God can replace you on your job with a more wicked person. And you'd be like, why did he get the job? Because you're not following my my orders here. You're not walking closely with me. So God can use whoever he wants to accomplish his purposes. So God waited patiently for 390 years. In fact, he said that the the, the abominations of the Canaanites is not yet complete. And it's like, how much more wicked are you going to let them get? God's like, I'm going to wait. I'm patient. And he waited waited almost 400 years before he decided to destroy them. But also, here's the thing. When you say things like, how can a loving God throw you know, people into hell? That's the wrong question. How can a holy God not throw all of us in hell? How can anybody even go to heaven? As wicked as we are, okay, we need to realize that God showing mercy on some doesn't mean that he's being unfair to others. All of us, all of us, everybody say all. All of us deserve judgment. Number three, God uses many means to bring down his judgment. Okay, he and he alone knows what that's about. In fact, remember there in the New Testament, the disciples came to Jesus and said, "Hey, remember that tower that fell and killed seventeen people? Were what were they doing wrong? What was their sin?" He said, "Jesus said, don't look at them. Don't be surprised that a tower doesn't fall on all of you. We all deserve sin. We all deserve to be judged. And God can use towers. He can use war." He can use hurricanes. He can use whatever he wants to judge people. And again, not everybody who's a victim of a natural catastrophe or war uh, is God judging it for a specific thing. But what, here's the problem. When you and I sin, it hurts other people. Let's say that you, dad, you do something really stupid and you go to jail. Your wife and your children are going to suffer because of your sin. That's the way sin works. It spreads. That's why we should not mess with it at all. And then 
Realize this also. What's happening here in Deuteronomy is a unique set of circumstances, okay? This is God, and he has set up a theocracy. It means God is king. There is no human government. I'm, the, I'm, I'm the, uh, the, the king of this country, and Moses is my mouthpiece. You do what I say. And so he's working in a special situation. We can't take everything in Deuteronomy and apply it to the United States of America. We can't say, oh, two people called in adultery. Stone them. You know, we don't do that. And it's not, people say, well, you're inconsistent. The Bible says this, and you should do this. No, it doesn't say you should do it. It says Israel should have done this. So don't, things, don't take things that apply to Israel and apply it to every circumstance. We can take the principles that are involved, but not the laws. These are laws for a specific country. There's other countries where it's, there's certain laws that we don't practice here in America, and it's good for them, maybe not be good for us. But we're not talking about different set of morals. We're just talking about different applications of those morals. Verse 3 says, you shall not intermarry with them. And here's what's interesting. The reason they would intermarry wasn't just because of attractiveness, although that was sometimes the case, especially with Samson. Um, Samson had big problems, didn't he? But it shows God can use any idiot. And, but what was happening here is the giving and the taking was when you had two countries that maybe were potentially going to go to war or maybe they had been at war, but now they want to have a truce, they would say, hey, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of my daughters. You give me a whole bunch of your sons. And now they're going to have grandkids over there, and you're going to have grandkids over here. I'm going to be less likely to attack you again because my grandkids are over there, and my daughters are over there, and your sons are over here. So by intermarrying, it was a way of a treaty. And that's why Solomon had so many hundreds of wives. It wasn't because he was like that crazy, although he was quite a knucklehead when it came to intimacy issues. But it was because he's making so many treaties in a pagan way instead of trusting God to keep the peace in that situation. And so what the, the application to us as believers, as we fast forward to the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, this is, this is a verse that we need, you, if you're in this room and you're single, or if you're in this room and married, you might be single again someday because of death, or maybe unfortunately because of divorce. Everybody needs to understand this verse. If you have given your life to Jesus Christ, this verse still applies to you. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. What does that mean, Gary? means you don't marry lost people. And if you're not going to marry lost people, then why would you even date lost people? Because dating is to find out, are you compatible for marriage? And keep in mind that dating is a 20th century, maybe 19th century at the latest, earliest, American thing. Do you still realize that most of the world does not do dating? Okay, They have arranged marriages, or they have other re ways of doing it. I'm not saying necessarily one is right and wrong, but they all need to be done, if you're a child of God, in a Christian way, in a way that honors Lord Jesus Christ. We, don't, we should not be involved in missionary dating. Well, I'm going to date her for a while, and hopefully she comes to Jesus. Now, what ends up happening is you end up going down the wrong path, and then missionary dating leads to missionary marriage, and then three years into it, when he's saying, I don't like your church. Your church is a bunch of knuckleheads. You're like, oh, I don't know why I married him. Well, hello, you disobeyed Scripture. Okay? And he asked, some, he asked several rhetorical questions. For what partnership... And that's what marriage is, right? It's a partnership. Has righteousness, not because you're so great, but because you've received the righteousness of Christ with lawlessness. Someone who is saying, I don't want anything to do with the laws of God. I don't want God to be in my life. What partnership is there? What's the answer to that question? None. Let's, let's ask the next, answer the next question. Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Answer is none. What accord has Christ with Belial? None, okay? Or what portion does a believer, in case you weren't catching all these other analogies, share with an unbeliever? None. Raise your children to seek someone who loves Jesus. And let me just interject, by the way, it doesn't matter what color they are, they love Jesus, okay? It should not be, well, what college are they going to, you know? Or, you know, is he good looking or not? Is he this, that? Do they love Jesus is question number one. After that, everything else is minor. But if they, we need to chain our children, no matter what, that they love Jesus. Verse 4, he says, For they would turn away your sons from following me. Whenever you have a mixed relationship, lost person, saved person, nine times out of ten, the believer goes away from God. And this is what happened. You saw this happen over and over and over with Israel. They started compromising, started letting pagan people practice things. They started marrying pagan women. Next thing you know, the whole country's wrapped up in idolatry, and it's not a healthy situation. We can't please God with that. He says, but thus you shall deal with them. 
You shall break down their altars, dash into pieces their pillars, chop down their ashram, and burn their carved Im images. Break, dash, chop, burn. Little violent picture here, right? How do we, as God's people, deal with sin? Well, it's okay. Just a little bit won't hurt. I'm just going to kind of put it over here. and It's kind of getting too big for me to handle, but I, I can manage, you know. And everybody does it a little bit. Man, that's not what God's saying at all. God's saying smash it, crash it, burn it, destroy it. Don't dabble with sin. You know, you, you may enter in relationships. Well, yeah, I know he's not a Christian, but he's a good guy, and I like him a lot. And well, We have so much in common. Man, cut it off. Text him and say, Un <laughs> unfollow, blocked, you're, you're gone, you're history. You can put it a nice way if you want, but you have no business with dealing with that. Now, am I saying you don't have lost friends? I'm not saying that at all. I'm talking about entering into intimate relationships, okay? We're talking about, and by the way, you could even apply 2 Corinthians 6 to business partnerships. I don't think you should be co-owners of a business with someone who doesn't know the Lord. That, that, that's what the word accord means in that. But that's a, a whole other subject, and I'm starting to stop preaching and start meddling there. But we should be very aggressive when it comes to dealing with sin in our lives and not tolerate just a little bit. We should be very aggressive about purging it out of our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Look what he says when, when he talks about the, the, the analogy to Israel going into the promised land is the parallel is us entering into the mature Christian life, okay? It, the promised land is not heaven. For, ignore all those southern gospel songs that talk about the promised land in heaven. It's talking about the victorious Christian life, okay? And it, it talks about that if you're going to be successful, you've got to treat it like a war. We are in a war. Look at your neighbor and tell them we're in a war. We're, we are in a war. We, look at what Paul says here. We are not waging war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not the, of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive, like prisoner of war, to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience in your own life. Every thought that wants to disobey the Lord, you say, no, no, shut up. I'm not listening to you. Do you know what that's what fasting is about? It is telling your flesh, you are not going to tell me what I'm going to do. I'm going to listen to the Holy Spirit of God. And every time my stomach growls, I'm going to get on my knees and pray. Every time I'm really wanting to go eat something, that's what fasting is about. It's telling your flesh, you are not the boss. The Holy Spirit is the boss. I'm going to listen to the Lord and not to you. And it's beating down your flesh and suppressing it. So let me ask you a question. Is your life pretty easy going right now? Man, I really like my job. Me and my wife are good along. We like our new house. and Everything's going great. And, and man, everything's just smooth. Man, God's just blessing. You know, and and there, are, there may be seasons like that, but that tends to be the trend. My question for you would be, could it be that you pose no threat to the enemy? Could it be that you're not even in the war? <laughs> you're totally off the battle lines and you're, you're, you're just back home while everybody else is engaged in the battle. You, we need to make sure that we're engaged in the battle. And we, what enemies do you need to purge out of your life? What is it you're struggling with most? Greed? Lust? You have an addiction? Are you selfish? Lazy? I mean, we can all, I mean, man, all those just applied to me real all right off the bat. Now I'm just talking to me. How about you? What are you? What's your problems, okay? We need to treat them not as just, well, every, that's just the way I am. That's the way God made me and start blaming it on God like God, Adam blamed Eve. We need to say, you know what? Those things are an enemy to me entering into the promised land. I need to destroy those things. I need to get victory over those. I need to just have none of it. You know, if you have to unsubscribe from cable, do so. If you have to get a dumb phone instead of a smartphone, do whatever. You know, when you're in war, desperate times call for what? Desperate measures. And if you've got an addiction, man, you need some serious help. And again, I'm talking to probably half people in this room, if not more. We need to take it as if it's war and not just, just uh, kind of play around with it as if it's a minor problem. So now let's talk about the passion of the Lord. The passion of the Lord. He says in verse 6, for, for, you, if you, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Man, do you hear a passion in God's voice when he says all that? Talk about a people and think about what a bunch of dummies the Israelites were. And think about all, man, wish we were back in Egypt. We got free food. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> You were slaves, that's why you got free food. You didn't, you didn't have any money to buy it with, they, they had to give it to you. They gave you, they told you to break, make bricks with no straw. Oh yeah, but we had 
garlic and leeks and onions. What? <laughs> I mean, they were just complaining about every little thing. And, and, and yet God says, you know what? I love you so much. You're my treasured possession. <laughs> that's, that's, that's just amazing that God would even think of us that way and the children of Israel. He said, for, it was not because you were more numbered. Than, oh, any me, well, let's see. Oh, wow, there's a big country. That's my chosen people. No, that wasn't it. He says, and he said, the Lord set his love on you and he chose you for you were the fewest. Now think about this. I was meditating on this scripture. I'm like, wait a minute. When did God choose Israel? Who was the first Jew? Abraham. He says, when you were the fewest among people, when you were one, when you were one person, and I knew that Abraham would become a multitude of people and number and bless them like the stars of the heaven and the sands of the sea. But when you were just one person, I called Abraham out of the earth of the Chaldees and says, from you, I'm going to make a nation. And that's why I loved you. Before you were even a sparkle in your mom's eye, I loved you when you were just one person. So I didn't pick the biggest. I didn't pick the best. I picked what I saw in the future because what I what I love. And look at this. Is. Why did he love you? It's because the Lord loves you. You talk about circular reasoning. God can get away with it. Why does God love you? Because God loves you. And, and why? Why does God do that? You know, what, why? It's, it's like, have, have anybody else said this? You know, when your wife asks you, honey, why do you love me? You're like, oh, man. <laughs> I am in trouble now. Okay. Um, and, and we will say the standard answers. Tammy, I love you because you have the most beautiful green eyes. I love you. You're so pretty. You're so kind. You're so generous. You love children. You love the Lord. You love all these things. But what if any of those stopped? What about when your spouse is old and wrinkly and not so attractive? What about when they're going through a really difficult time and they're not so kind and generous? What if they stray from the Lord? You going to stop loving them then? You see, the right answer is, I love you because God put us together, and he loves me unconditionally, and I'm going to love you unconditionally for the rest of my life. That's the right answer. Okay, husbands, you can thank me later for that one, okay? I got you out of a lot of trouble with that. Um, John 4, 4, 1 John 4, 16, so we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. God, you see, you and I, we're not love. We practice love. God is love. That's, that's, that's who he is. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. And that's wives and husbands and parents and children. That's what gives you the ability to love unconditionally. When your kids are being idiots, you love them unconditionally. When your parents are being idiots, you love them unconditionally. When other church members aren't being what they should be, and I'll say it, idiots, you love them unconditionally, right? Man, this, this kind of love, like, well, she no longer meets my needs, or that church, I just don't feel like I'm being fed. Notice where that starts, I'm being fed. I, I, and we, we don't have that unconditional love that God has for us. I'm glad that God's not that fickle. God loves us because he loves us. That's who he is. Amen? Verse 9 says, now, Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. Okay? Don't forget, you're, there is a God and you're not him. There is, God is God. And then watch this. Notice this language here. Faithful, keeps covenant, steadfast love. What does that sound like to you? It's a marriage. Okay? Covenant. When you get married, that, you enter into a covenant. And God keeps that marriage covenant. Okay? He, God in this passage right here is describing himself as the faithful husband, husband who honors his vows and will love the, his wife Israel no matter what. And that's the kind of love he has for us as the church. Those who love him and keep his commandments. He, he says there's a special kind of love that he has, especially if you're obedient. Okay. Now, again, there's not two things. God's not saying, well, only if you do this. He's talking about I love you no matter what, but as long and when you love me, I love you even more. And, and then, as if that were possible, I don't want to go into that today. But here, here's what we have to realize. Let me actually go back to this. Make sure I didn't skip too much here. All right, yeah, there, there's where I want to be, right there. Hold on. Go to the next slide for me. There we go. Watch this, though. And he says, and he repays to their face those who hate him. Now, when he says those who keep my commandments, he's not saying, if you keep my commandments, I love you. He's saying, you, I know that you're my child because you keep my commandments. See, people who say, I'm a Christian, but don't keep his commandments. Jesus says, why do you even call me Lord? <laughs> You're totally faking the whole thing. 
Okay? If you're a Christian, you will not be perfect, but your lifestyle will be trending upward. Okay? You may have dips and valleys, but the overall sanctification progress is happening. Okay? Anyway, but those who hate him, they show it. And he said, watch this. This is, this is aggressive language again. He repays it to their face. Remember like you were in seventh grade and someone says, hey, Joe says he could beat you up. Oh, yeah? We'll have him tell it to my face. Okay? Let's see how much he can do that then. And, you know, people can sit there and say, oh, I don't believe in a God. How can God do all this? And how can I allow? Tell it to God's face. Okay? And I'm not trying to just beat up on lost people because I was lost too. Okay? You need to realize that you will answer to God. And, and here's my thing. If you're watching online and you're like not really sure if this Christianity thing is for you, let me just tell you. I believe, and I think you do too, that deep down in your heart, you know that there's something bigger than you. You can call it higher power. You can call it whatever you want. And because he's made it very clear to us what is right and wrong, you know, basically Ten Commandments go anywhere in the world you want to go, and we're not doing very good at keeping them. There's something that says, I'm going to answer to this person, whoever he or she may be. And again, I believe he's a he, but that's a whole other topic for another sermon. But he's, he's, he says he repaid to face those who hate him. By destroying them, he will not be slack with one who hates him. He will repay him. Again, he repeats the phrase, to his face. This is scary because the truth is someday every single person will face God. And everything you've said about God, how he doesn't exist, you will have a chance to say it to his face. You will face God. And I don't mean this to be in a threatening way. I'm just telling you, this is the reality of hum humanity, that we are a rebellious race who really deep down inside, we hate God. We want to be our own God. But here's the promise from the Apostle Paul. He says that every knee shall bow to me. Did you know that lost people will bow to the Lord as Lord? I'm sorry, saved people will bow to the Lord as Lord, and lost people will bow to the Lord as judge. But everybody's going to bow. Every knee will bow to him. Every tongue shall confess. See, here's the thing. You can confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in his death or resurrection now, or you can confess it to the judge and say, yes, you were right. And then you'll, be, you'll still be punished. You have this opportunity right here, right now. And you say, well, you know, what about those who've never heard? Again, what about you, though? You have heard. You're hearing it right now. Okay? We could talk about those other people in a hypothetical if you want. But let's talk about you right now. You, you know there is a God. You know that you're a sinner. I know that I'm a sinner. And my only hope is Jesus Christ. And I hope that you will confess Jesus Christ as Lord right now as your Lord, instead of confessing later to a judge. Verse 12 says, so then each of us will give an account of himself. Y your parents won't give an account for you. You won't give an account for other people. You will give an account for yourself. So there's the purging of the land, which equates to us as purging out sinner life. There's the passion of the Lord he not only has for Israel, but he has for us as his chosen people as well. And then we bring to the third point, the promise of the Lord. The promise of the Lord. It says, and because you listen." To these rules and keep and do these, keep and do them. Talking about the Ten Commandments, he says, "The Lord your God will keep the covenant. Keep you, will keep with you the covenant." Okay, so we are we are called to obey, and God promises those who obey, He will continue to love. He says, "He will love you, will bless you, and multiply you." And notice, it's everything from your womb to the ground that hurts. But here's the key: in the land, this is a promise to Israel. Picture a friend you have who loves Jesus with all her heart and is not able to have children. Oh, well, you need to claim Deuteronomy 7.13. No, she doesn't. Deuteronomy 7.13 is for Israel. Only God, this was a mirac miraculous thing that happened here. Remember, what happened to Israel's clothes while they were in the wilderness? Nothing. <laughs> they looked brand new. They probably still had the tags on them, you know. They were walking. What happened to their Nikes? Nothing. They looked brand new. That was a miracle. And this is a promise from God that when you enter into the promised land, if you keep my commandments, everybody's having babies. Your cows are having babies. Your dogs are having babies. Everybody's having babies. We're just having babies all left and right. When he says be fruitful and multiply, he's being serious. Okay? It's going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. And as long as you're obedient, everything's going to go great. This was a promise from God to Israel in the promised land. So don't take this Old Testament theology and apply it to your life and say, well, God's not blessing me and my cows aren't whatever and my womb and all that stuff. Don't, don't, don't twist the scripture that way. It's all about, like I tell you all the time, it's all about context. Read the verse in its context. doesn't mean that God doesn't want to bless people, but don't take these as guarantees. And he says, and you shall be blessed above all peoples. Now, God's blessing them because he loves them because he loves them, but he's also giving them a lifestyle that is 
so different than the rest of the world. We don't really even thank the Lord for how much civility we have, which isn't enough, but in the 21st century. The very fact that politicians don't just shoot each other all the time, you know, that was the world back then. Just even a couple hundred years ago, you didn't like somebody, you shot them. That's just the way it was. And you, didn't, you couldn't call 911. And the civility that we have, did you know we had to thank Christianity for all that? The fact that you should help the poor and have orphanages and adopt children, all those things are Christian. The, the, Jesus Christ introduced all these two. In a Roman world where it was anything goes, and if you don't like somebody, kill them. And if you, don't, if you want somebody, rape them. All that was normal. Christianity said, no, no, we're not behaving that way. And other religions of the world adopted a lot of Christian principles not to look bad. It really was the blessing of God upon his people. So they truly were a shining light to the world amongst a bunch of people who were burning their children. Okay, So there's an amazing contrast here. He says, and there shall not be male or female barren among you um, or among your livestock. Again, that was a promise for a special situation here in Israel. Doesn't mean that God promises children to everybody. He, he, he can, I know, you and I know of several people who can't have children because God wanted them to adopt. And that adopting that children, those children was the best thing they ever did. And even then, take it farther. All sickness and none of the evil diseases of Egypt. Again, this was a promise to Israel that they weren't going to be sick. And Israel, Egypt was a very disease-stricken country because they disobeyed God. I mean, Israel was taught, wash your hands before you eat. And even only until a couple hundred years ago in medicine did doctors even wash their hands after examining different patients. That's a recent development. The Bible's been telling you that for thousands of years. I saw one meme where this guy says to the girl, uh, I don't think the Bible has anything relevant to say today in the 21st century. And she says, the Bible says, wash your hands, don't touch bats, and, and uh, if you're sick, quarantine yourself. <laughs> and talk about relevant for today. It definitely, definitely is. So Israel was a shining light. Jesus called a city set on a hill. That wasn't just something that was made up there in Matthew chapter 5 when he did the Sermon on the Mount. They had been called the city on the hill and the shining light for hundreds of years. And he's reminding them, hey, Israel, you're a city, you're the light of the world. What are you doing with all this fake religion stuff? You're a city set on a hill. You can't be hidden. Don't cover up your light with all this legalism and this all fake religion. And that's, that's the, the, what he gives to us as his church. He said, but you, child of God, in the body of Christ, you are a chosen race. Just like Israel is my chosen ethnic race, you are my chosen spiritual race. If you're part of the body of Christ, you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. Do you realize every religion in the world says you go to a priest and the priest talks to God for you? Buddhists have priests. Hindus have priests. Muslims have the equivalent of an imam. You know, Catholic Church has priests. You know what the Bible says about you if you're in the body of Christ? You're your own priest. You get to go directly into the Holy of Holies and, and ask God boldly before the throne of grace. That, that, that's amazing right there. That you are a chosen priesthood, a holy nation, and here's why. A people for his own possession. Sounds just like Deuteronomy 7. You're my treasured possession. And, and why did he do that for us? What, what's the purpose of just so we can have great self-esteem? No, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you. If you're enjoying the whole idea of, man, I'm chosen, I'm royal, I am a holy nation, I'm a people for God's possession, yay. Go out and tell somebody, please. Go tell them how even though you weren't worthy of any of this, and neither are they, but they can become one too. If this doesn't translate in proclaiming the excellencies, then we're just spoiled children. The purging of the land, the passion of the Lord, and then the promise of the Lord, that brings us to the next one. The protection of the Lord. The protection of the Lord. Verse 17 says, If you say in your heart, notice where the problem begins. Well, these nations are greater than I. How can I dispossess them? Man, do you see several things wrong with that? First of all, you're dealing with what your feelings say, what's in your heart, versus what's, what's reality. I mean, hello, the most powerful king on the planet, Pharaoh of Egypt, God destroyed him like nothing. Ten plagues, and you guys just walked out with loot in your pockets. You didn't do anything. You didn't pick up any swords. You didn't throw any rocks. You guys walked out full of riches and treasures. And you walked, in, walked out there and I fed you in the wilderness. God did all that for you. And why are you saying now, well, how can I 
do this when someone's greater than me? And how can I dispossess them? Whoever said you needed to do it? <laughs> how many chapters now is God saying, and I will cast them out. I will do this. I will do this. And you know, we do the same thing, believers today. Oh, I lost my job. I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. Who's been paying your bills all along? God has. Who's given you the breath to wake up and go to work in the morning? God has. Who puts food on your table? God. You say, well, I do it myself. No, God's the one that gives you the ability to do all those things. God's the one that lets you be born here in Texas of all places. Isn't that amazing, right? I mean, you, to get up in the morning and stress about stuff, saying, well, how can I do this? How can I do this? First of all, you're using the wrong pronoun. It should be, how is he going to do it? And I'll leave that up to him. He knows what he's doing. He, he's been in charge of the universe forever. He says in verse 18, he says, and you shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember what the Lord your God did. Remember what the Lord your God did. There's a, there's a connection between your fear and what stresses you and your failure to remember what God has done for you. There's a direct connection there. He, he says, in, he said, the great trials that you saw, remember? You know, I, I turned the Nile into blood. I struck down the firstborn. I, I you know, caused locusts and frogs, all kinds of crazy things. You saw great signs and wonders. Do you, are you experiencing amnesia? What's going on right here? He says, you should not be in dread of them. For the Lord your God is in your midst. I really don't like the phrase, the big guy upstairs. I, I think it's very disrespectful, okay? Sorry if you've said it to me recently. I'm just telling you the truth now in front of everybody. Um, it's not the big guy upstairs, okay? First of all, he's your heavenly father, but he's here in your midst. He's not like Allah who wants no personal relationship with the human beings because he's just way too good for you. He is willing to become one of you and live with you and go through life with you. Who wants to be there with you when you cry? Who wants to be with you when you get the pink slip? Who wants to be there beside your bed when you get the bad diagnosis? He's there in your midst. We should be thankful for that. And so what stresses you out the most, think about it, is where you're experiencing the presence of God the least. We, we include God in this part of our life. We include God in this part of our life. But we, we got this one under control. And I guarantee you that's the one that's stressing you out. Invite God to be a part of every aspect of your life and don't stress it. Leave it up, the protection up to him. Verse 22 says, For the Lord your God will clear away these nations before you little by little. First of all, you don't have to ask, how am I going to dispossess him? He says he's going to do it. But number two, notice, could God have wiped out all seven nations at once? Absolutely. And this is where we get frustrated with God. God says, I'm not going to do it all at once. I'm going to do a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there. I'm like, God, can't we just pull the bandaid off and just rip it once? No. What would happen if God did it all at once? We'd go back to complaining. We would think like, we, we got this. I got this. I'm going to handle it now. Okay, thanks, God, for you doing that. I got it from here. God's like, I want you every day on your face saying, God, I can't make it today without you. God, I'm totally dependent on you. I'm, I'm not even worthy to be alive without you. And he wants you to be totally dependent little by little so that you'll be praying little by little. And here's just an interesting side note here. He says, you, you, and here's another reason God is doing it little by little. He says, you may not make an end of them at once, lest the wild beasts grow too numerous for you. If I killed all seven nations at once and there's dead bodies everywhere, Lions and tigers and bears, oh my. You're going to have a big problem with wild animals everywhere. You won't be able to handle all the wild animals. So God says, I just don't want too many dead bodies around all. By the way, now I'm going to do a little by little to teach you a lesson as well. Um, so God is our warrior. Jesus did a surprise attack on planet Earth. And, and what was the surprise? Is number one, that he came and when he came. And number two, how he came. Baby in a manger. Nobody saw that coming, Okay but also how he did it. They're, they're putting down you know, palm branches and their clothes in the road saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us now, deliver us now. Man, kick the Romans in the teeth. Let's go. We're ready to revolt. We're ready to throw off and stop paying their taxes and stop having them you know, be brutal to us. We're ready to have a revolution we're in, a, in, a, in, a, in the wrong sense of the word. And Jesus totally did a surprise attack. He did things different than anybody was expecting. He conquered the enemy of death by dying. Usually when you conquer someone, you kill them and you're alive. But Jesus doesn't do things our way. He, he, uh, Jesus defeated sin by becoming sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. And he was crowned a king 
with thorns. He did things totally backwards from the way you and I would have done it. Total sneak attack the way Jesus did things. Colossians 2 says, having forgiven us all our trespasses. How did he do it? By canceling the record of debt. Every single one of us owes a debt of sin to God. Jesus paid off that debt that stood against us with its legal demands. The le- what's the legal demand for your sin debt? Legally, it's required you die. But Jesus paid the debt. We're satisfying all those legal demands, and he set them aside. And how did he do it? Nailing it to his cross. Man, the gospel is so amazing. The gospel is so amazing that, that God would do that. He sets up all these commands, and we stink at keeping them. He says, but don't worry about it. I got you. I got your back. I'm going to put your sin on my back. I'm going to take the beatings on my back so that you don't have to worry about you failed at the Ten Commandments that I gave to Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 7. I'm going to bring you into the promised land. I'm going to make you a mature Christian. I'm going to help you to grow in Christ. He says, "For here's Colossians still. He disarmed the rulers. Okay, think about it. In Israel, they got these seven enemies. Well, we got all these, you can say seven deadly sins. There's a whole lot more than that for sure. We got all these sins and all these evil against us and the authorities, and he put them to open shame. You know how a conquering king put another king to open shame? They would beat them to, to a pulp. They'd bring them out into the streets, usually naked. They'd throw them down at the feet of the king, and that king would take his foot and step right on his throne and raise his sword, just humiliating this king in front of everybody. And Jesus did that to your sin. Think about that. Think about what you struggle with most. Jesus threw it down on the ground, stepped on its throat, and says, you're not going to give into this anymore. I've conquered it. You don't have to go to hell. I went through hell for you. He triumphed over them. And how did he do it? In him, in, in Jesus Christ. Think about what Jesus went through for you and I. I would like for you to just focus on God right now by bowing your head and closing your eyes. Whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, you're not sure what you are, Right now, you have the privilege of talking to God. And I hope the Holy Spirit of God has has spoken to your heart this morning. If you know for sure that you've been saved, that you've trusted in what Jesus did on that cross for you, and you know that you've been born again by the Holy Spirit of God, I I just beg you right now, please pray. Just pray that God opens hearts. But if you're like, okay, I, I don't know. This, this Christianity stuff is new to me. I'm not really sure. I've kind of believed the skeptics. Or wherever you find yourself right now, you can know for sure that you're a Christian today. You can know for sure that all those things that you've done, and I'm just like you, sin just weighing on my shoulders, all those things, they can be given away. They can be given to Christ if you give your life to him. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, He died for you. He's buried and rose again. The Bible says you shall be saved. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Feel free to look that up. So I'm going to invite you right now, if you don't know for sure you're saved, would you in your heart of hearts just have a conversation with Jesus? It could go something like this. The words won't save you, just your faith will. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I thank you that you died for all my sins, not just some of them, all of them. I'm just... I'm so thankful that you were the one that was beaten instead of me. You're the one who died on that cross in my place. And Lord Jesus, I trust you right now. No one else has done for me what you've done. No one else has loved me the way you have. And so I give my life to you because you gave your life for me. I trust you. I believe you died for me. And I thank you for forgiving all my sins. And if you, if you prayed that prayer, I would like for you to tell me about it. I'd like for you to contact me. Let me know. I want to take you through what it means to be a Christian and what your next steps are. If you made that decision, you're born again today. All your sins, past, present, and future are forgiven. Amen. In just a moment, like I said, we're going to have a question and answer session. So feel free to start texting those now. If this is your first time here at Revolution, we want to give you a T-shirt. We got T-shirts at the back table back there. And this is the Deuteronomy t-shirt. It's awesome. And just fill out one of those connect cards so we can just ask you about how your visit today. If you uh, are an attender and still want a t-shirt just for a donation of 10 bucks, you can get one. Um, also, uh, I want to just thank you very much for being a given church. Uh, we just came through a season where our missionaries have just had a very difficult time because of the pandemic. And we were able to send them an extra offering. Even just this week, we, we had this carpet we paid a guy $150 to come out and trim it so that it would fit in there. And one of our people just said, hey, I'll pay for that. And they put up the $150 bucks right out of their pocket out of cash. You know, I had my 
church credit card ready to go. And I said, no, no, I'll get it. So I just really appreciate that our church is very generous in that. And you guys do stuff like that all the time, just showing that you love the Lord. Um, I want to invite you to meet with me sometime this week. We'll meet for a cup of coffee. You don't drink coffee. I'll buy you anything else you want to drink or whatever. But I, even if you've done, had coffee with me 20 times, let's do it. If they, or if you've never had it. I meet with people all the time. I just want to get to know you. and want you to be able to get to know your pastor. Um, how how y'all doing with your 2021 challenge? Good? Good? Hey, don't be superstitious. They'll say, oh, I broke it last week, so I forget it. No, no. It's not about the streak. It's about consistency. It's just like your diet. You know, you ate a Snickers yesterday. That's in the past. God forgives your sin. You just move on. You keep try to eat better tomorrow, right? Um, so oh, make the 2021 challenge, in case you don't know, is the first thing you open every morning is your Bible. Whether it's on your app or your paper Bible or whatever you do, make sure that's thing. And again, I text the church probably almost every day with certain updates about prayer requests, about life groups, different things like that. So if you want to be on that list, here's your information right there. And by the way, did you know that if you, how many of you download, how many of you open up the U version for the slides this morning? Anybody do that? Did you know at the top right you could push save? Because if you don't push save, after tomorrow they'll be gone. But if you push save, you could review this later in the week or you could share it with somebody. So be sure to push save so you can use that. Um, we have a Wednesday night life group down there that's still doing, are y'all still doing The Chosen? Yeah, that's awesome. So good, good deal. Thank you, Heather. Nobody else was going to speak up. You're just going to leave me hanging here. And then there's the other lame life group in Texas City. But anyway, just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, anyway, uh, and then this one over here in Paraline. So there's several to choose from. In fact, we want to create more. So please, uh, if you're interested in the life group, even if it's just for three or four people at your house, or if you want to meet at a coffee shop or somewhere, let me know. We'd love to give you the material you need to lead. You don't need to be a teacher. You just need to be able to have people where you're at and be able to ask questions. And we even provide the questions. We still need some volunteers. Right now we've got children's ministry going on in two places. We're, at, we're going to continue to expand our children's ministry during the service, but it's going to take more volunteers to do so. So please, um, please volunteer. Text Tammy and let me know. All right, let's, let's see what questions we have. And uh, the band guys, you guys can come up because I don't know how many questions I have. We'll see. We may have. All right. This one, first one says, will you comment on the idea that many American Christians are responding to the current political unrest from a place of toxic nationalism? Should we as Christians not defend biblical ideas that made this country great? How should we respond to the current assault on Christian ideals, religious freedom, etc.? Man, that's a great question. And it just, it's so sad, and it's not just an American thing, it's just a human thing, that we can't seem to stop the pendulum, you know? And I'll just, just put it right out there, okay? I voted for Donald Trump, not because I like the guy. I think he's a, a jerk and a mega, megalomaniac, okay? I think he's egotistical. I think he has lots of issues. But I, I, when one party says we believe in the, in the right to life for the unborn and one party says we believe in abortion at any time up until birth, how can I vote for killing children? Period. I don't even care who's better on the economy or peace in the Middle East. That's why I vote. Now, if you didn't vote for Trump because you think he's a jerk and not very godly, more power to you, okay? I'm just telling you what made my choice. But I don't think if you voted for Biden, I should call you not a Christian. And I don't think if I voted for Trump, you should call me a nationalist, white, racist hater, okay? I held my nose when I voted for him both times, okay? So it's like we were choosing between the lesser of two evils. And yes, there may come a day where we can't vote at all. And some Christians believe we were already there. And I can respect that. But I think as long as you have one person saying, I believe in traditional marriage and I want to protect the rights of Christians. And by the way, I recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital, which no president's ever done before. I'm with them on that. Again, do I like the rest of the stuff he does? No, I can't stand it. Okay. I think... He did, I think he polarized people to where, that's why he got more votes than any other president in history, and Biden topped that because people hate him so much. I think he made it so much about him because of his ego that people are like, I don't care, I'm going to vote against Trump, not, not necessarily voting for Biden. Anyway, um, you can stand for values without embracing the person. And it's not because 
Uh, I do believe in American exceptionalism. I do, believe, I do believe God blesses America and in a unique way. He blesses other countries too. But there, there are freedoms we have here in America that other countries don't have. And we're the role model for that. So anyway, uh, but the main thing is, and this is the answer, I am a Christian first. I am a conservative second. I just happen to be a cracker also, because that doesn't matter, all right? I am a Christian. That's the, one, that's the thing that matters most. And so we may vote differently, but if we love Jesus, we shouldn't, we shouldn't engage in a name calling. So here we go. As Christians, we are supposed to publicly profess our faith in Christ and not deny our God. In certain circumstances, like in other countries, where profession may result in death, are those people required to publicly profess, or are they an exception and not required to do so? Man, this is, this is a heavy question. And I'm going to read the side note, too. Side note, not a question. Since I'm new here, I can say a few words today if you want me to, just in case something comes up next Sunday. Okay, yeah, let's talk about that after church if you want. I'm not, and, um, so let's talk about. So and, and, and it's interesting. Um, David Platt talks a lot about taking the gospel to countries where, like we support missionaries who are in countries where they're not allowed to be there. That's why we can't, we can't even name the country that they're in or name their names because they're there undercover. And when, they, when people get saved, they ask them, who are the five people who are least likely to kill you if they found out you were a Christian? <laughs> and then they said, start with them. Tell them you're a believer. Like if your mom probably won't kill you because you're a believer, start with your mom and tell her. And so, but I think here's where the rubber meets the road, if you will. If, if, if someone put a gun to your head and said, are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Yes, you have to confess. I don't think you need to put on a Deuteronomy t-shirt and walk the streets of, of Iran, you know, and be a target, literally, okay? But I think if, if push came to shove and someone says, are you a Christian? You'd say, yes, I am. And you'd have to join the millions of martyrs in all throughout history who died for the cause of Christ. So um, I don't think it, it's just be, I, the only best words I can give you is what, uh, what Luke wrote in the book of Acts, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Be wise about when you say it, and just be harmless, but, only, but when push came to shove, you have to do it. Here's a question from someone watching online. Can you give a good definition for judge or judgment? Does the Bible use different words to mean this in different contexts? Yes, is the short answer. True judgment belongs to God, but aren't we also called the judge, when it means weigh, what is right and wrong? Absolutely. Uh, that's my words, absolutely. To sharpen each other in love. It's interesting. Everybody wants to quote Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not, lest you be judged. Stop there. See, don't judge me. Don't judge me. Yeah, I stole that. But don't judge me. Yeah, no, I lied and didn't go to work today and said I was sick. Don't judge me. Okay. How about Matthew 7, 24? Jesus says, judge, judge with righteous judgment. When he says in Matthew 7, 1, judge not lest you be judged, he explains what that means. You got to take the beam out of your own eye before you can help someone. In other words, if I'm sitting there going, man, you eat too much. <laughs> You know, hello, you got to put this down. First, you start telling other people what to do, okay? So, um, yes, we're supposed to judge. If, if you come to the door and you knock, if, if you beep the horn and go, hey, old man, send your daughter out. I'm here to pick her up. I'm going to judge you and say, she ain't coming out with you. Go away. Go see your parole officer. You ain't dating my daughter, Okay. I am going to judge you. Yes. You're going to act like that? You act a fool? I'm going to judge you. Okay? So, yeah, we're supposed to use common sense. How, do, how else do you do practice church discipline? If, if, a, if a man in our church was being abusive to his wife and unfaithful to her, Paul says you've got to confront him. If he won't hear you, you get another person to confront him. And if he won't hear you, what do you do? You bring him before the church. What is that? You're judging. But you're not judging with your own values and opinions. You're judging based on the Word of God. Great question. Um, Okay, someone just said they're still laughing about Microsoft Works. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, good deal. Uh, uh, now, as, as promised, Larry's question. Okay, so last week he, he said Je Jeremiah 33, 20 through 22. And, um, oh, I should have had that open and ready to read. Um, maybe I have it? Let me, let me. Okay, basically what it says, it says, if, if you break your covenant with me, I will also, it says that uh, if I can break the covenant with the sun rising and the moon coming up at night, then I will break my covenant with you. Do you see what's happening there? 
He's saying, that ain't going to happen. The sun's coming up tomorrow. Do I still love you? Yes. The moon came out tonight. Do I still love you? Yes. He's saying, I'll break my covenant with you the day the sun stops coming up. That's the answer to your question there, Larry. So it's, it, God's not breaking his covenant was Larry's question there. All right, hey, let's stand and let's sing just a little bit of this song that the message kind of was based on. Stop the Lord. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Stop the Lord Almighty. Check it out. Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is a lamb. For the sin of the world His blood breaks the chain Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb Every knee will bow before Him Amen Let's give him a shout of praise. You guys have a great week.